What's up? I have some clean code coverage. Just quick overview for you. I'm going off this list by Wojtek Lucas. I am sorry, I can't pronounce that. Who can't stand workarounds and spaghetti code. So he has created this nice little summary of clean code by Robert Cecil Martin. And I'm just gonna scratch across it real quick. Clean code, if it can be understood easily, oh, excuse me, code is clean if it can be understood easily by everyone on the team. Clean code can be read and enhanced by a developer other than its original offer. With understandability comes readability, changeability, extensibility, and maintainability. General rules. Follow standard conventions. I'm going to take a second on this one because it seems that you could really unpack that, right? That uh, conventions and standards, although there's a lot of overlap there in that terminology, there's also some separation because you have basically common conventions, then you have things like style guides that are more specific conventions to like a company maybe, and then you have coding standards, which would be kind of like a more extreme version of a style guide where it's not just indentation, naming rules, things like that. It's actually like structural rules about how the code's structured and tested and things like that. So I have, that's what all these tabs open right here are about and I'm just gonna breeze through those real quick. So we have coding conventions, the Wikipedia page, and that's a pretty good place to start a rabbit hole journey. I guess you could say if you come down here to the bottom, it has things like, these are the things that I would consider more like style conventions, comments, indentation, line length, naming, programming practices, principles, programming style conventions, just further links on that. And then if we come over here, we have, these are actual coding, what I consider more coding standards. And this is MRSA. It's from the automotive industry from the very end of last century, very beginning of this one, <clears throat> excuse me. And this is the MRSA 2004 edition. I don't think the editions are really matter a whole lot. If you notice like certain companies later up here, uh, just pick random editions and jump off from there. See, this says first published April 2016, even though it's supposedly the 2004 edition. I don't get that. Maybe they mean the, this uh, particular PDF or whatever. But it's from MRSA itself. So, although it sounds like a staph infection disease, it is, this one's more like uh, C programming specific rules like for embedded systems and cars. And I'm just gonna try and find something meaty down here. So this one refers to C99. A lot of the C stuff refers to like ANCC or C99. Uh, any expression, what do we got here? <laughs> Going too far. Come on. Okay, what do we have here? Am I passing a rule? Okay, any function with internal linkage can be an inline function for a function with external linkage. The following restrictions apply. Da, 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 da. It's important to understand the terms inline function, whatever. So it's just all stuff like that. So anyway, MRSA sees like one to check out if you're into that. This one's from the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratories, I believe. I don't know what's going on. My uh, browser won't scroll it. Okay, JPL, Institutional Coding Standard for the C Programming Language. From 2009, Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So that should be NASA. And they basically, this is based on the MRSA C thing, but they sort of just cherry picked what they wanted out of that. And this one's only 22 pages, so you could read this in one sitting. Pooping what I do, which is a sitting. Anyway, um, here's a list of all the a summary of everything. So they have uh, language uh, compliance, do not stray outside the language definitions, compile with all warnings enabled, stuff like that. 
not there's no perfect standard because even in I think it's this one when I was scrolling through it down somewhere there was like a double negative where they had used a coding example but they uh where was it I think it was this assert was it? um they used a coding example but they used a double right here so it says if not C assert P greater than zero compares to true return error. And yeah, it's not like a hard rule that they're talking about. This is just like a way to show like an assert example, but it's a horrible example because for one, they have a magic number there, zero, which is like, what is zero? You know, that should be turned into a constant that is makes it read well of what it is. And then this other thing of this not true so it's like flipping this evaluation because, you know, I don't know. I feel like that should just be if that, if like, if false compares to, you know, something more like a little easier to understand that, that just seems too easy to get in a rush or something, be skimming through and flip its meaning in your head. So that just goes to say none of these are perfect, but if you sort of combine forces with them, you could probably hash something out that's really nice. And this one is the Joint Strike Fighter Air Vehicle C++ coding standard. Um, I guess it's maybe the Air Force. December 2005, oh, Lockheed Martin Company. And this one's 140 pages, 141 pages, so it definitely has a lot more stuff in it. So just like the other ones, it's, I think, originally based a spin off of the MRSA C standard, of course, for C++. So they talk about templates, namespaces, just I'll click on one of those, like namespaces. Every non-local name except main should be placed in some namespace, C, Strusa, up, rationale, avoid name clashes in large programs, stuff like that. And then this is the Philips Healthcare C Sharp coding standard, a little more high level. So this just shows that all these industries, they use it and they're, um, you know, to try and make the code more rugged and robust and everything. These are just random rules. Let me scan down to one. So what do we have here? If possible, initialize variables at the point of declaration, stuff like that. So it doesn't just apply to C sharp, but the fact that it is C sharp, it's probably gonna apply mostly to high-level object-oriented type of languages. And then they also have one for C++, which I imagine would be pretty similar to that. But of course, touching on the lower level stuff, it's basically, oh, that one, it's twice as big, a little more like three, almost three times as big, which makes sense because the language is, definitely has many ways of doing things. There was one thing like using they're really big on these particular standards about using const and stuff like that and i used to be really big on that too but in my opinion now it's better to like prototype without such strict qualifiers on all of your stuff just go through and literally use the least amount of qualifiers on your variable names and things like that and then consider that an optimization when you go back and do that, a necessary optimization, especially if you're running in any uh, mission critical or safety critical, which is what these types of standards cover, then you'd want to go back and make sure you do const and all that. But in the beginning, to keep your code simple and easier to wrap your mind around and digest, and for others as well, don't use those. Just go for it. You know what I mean? And you should be doing, especially if you're doing mission critical, safety critical code, you should be doing 100% test driven development. And in doing test driven development, that should cover the cases. Anything you're worried about, you should be able to write, for the most part, be able to write a test for and go from there. And then if, you know, once you're going back and giving the code that polish after you get it working, um, go in and feel free to add const and things like that as necessary.
And I look at security as the same type of thing too, other than like, of course, a basic login. If you need a login, then, you know, you probably have to write that earlier on. But otherwise, anything to do with like security, wait till later. And then the other thing about that too is, with, especially with security, is that then you sort of have it separate because you might require, say you're writing a mobile app and a web app, but you're sharing the core code. The security might be drastically different on each type of platform, so that way you it just helps to keep it separate, keep them separated. Here's another particular standard. This is from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration recommendations for writing C code. A lot like the others. This one's only 21 page, one sitting. Uh, avoid magic numbers. Programming isn't magic, so don't encant it. Avoid spelling literal constants like 42 or 3.14 in code. They are not self-explanatory and complicate maintenance by adding hard-to-detect form of duplication. Use symbolic names and in expressions instead, such as width times aspect ratio. Example. And then this one's from University of Michigan, which I'm always surprised how much they pop up um, for stuff to do with like engineering and everything they must be a really good school for that because their stuff seems to be really high quality that I've noticed over the years and everything like their courses on edX and things like that okay each software organization will have its own coding standards or style guide for how to code enum types names different things like that so anyway that's all just shows you just how much follow standard conventions starts to unpack and I think mainly just in a nutshell follow standard conventions is like you know just code like people expect you know if you're coding in Python whatever use snake case names stuff like that prefer those anyway unless you're actually attaching a method to an object then you can maybe use the uh, camel case names or whatever but anyway that's all your discretion or your company's discretion, of course, right? Keep it simple, stupid. I prefer keep it short and simple. It's less offensive and even bundles in the whole short thing. Simple is always better. Reduce complexity as much as possible. I think that is should be the name of this whole document. It's KISS document. Boy Scout rule, leave the campground cleaner than you found it. This one in modern times isn't as quite as applicable. That's basically, you could just say refactor and refactor often. But when you go into add code to a code base or whatever, modify code, you're not going to, you shouldn't be cleaning and modifying code, so to speak, in the same, like modifying the actual logic in the same commit. If you are going to go in and clean the campground, which is cool, consider that like a refactoring process and do that as its own individual commit. So, and I've been yelled at for doing stuff like that on open source projects where back in the day where I'd go in and like adjust the white spacing of a particular file and within the same commit that I'm doing a pull request on for, you know, changing a few lines of code or whatever. And they're like, hey, keep the white space thing different in a different commit, different pull request. Always find root cause, always look for the root cause of a problem. That's to avoid patchiness. And also, so the problem doesn't come back around to bite you. So, so sit down, take your time. It shouldn't take you a whole lot longer. You know, don't look for simple workarounds and stuff like that. Just really try and nail it. Design rules. Keep configurable, configurable data at high levels. So say a constant is configurable. Um, other than something that's just describing a magic number, you know, so if it's a magic number, it can be way nested down in, if necessary, in some little function or something, but configurable data is stuff that people, you know, maybe even the user might want to get at, so you keep it in a config file, right, in a, just a plain text file, and then they can go in and edit it, and that's a high level, even though it might be used very deeply, maybe even only in one place in the program. Prefer polymorphism to if else or switch cases. Um, this is all written mainly with primarily with Java, maybe C a little bit in mind. So that can go several different ways, but 
or at least polymorphism can but this in this case then you just be switching on types uh, effectively instead of creating an old school if else switch case statement that's another thing too is some of these clean code standards are kind of leaning back towards when people came from a more structured programming background block structure uh, imperative language whatever you want to call it like pre oo background and uh, they sort of had to be told to get away from these you know use polymorphism as much as possible in place of those constructs separate separate multi-threading code that I think comes down to multi-threading code is low level so you want to keep that separate and also keep things that change separate so by keeping that multi-threadedness separate then if it if you implement it one way on one platform and another way on another platform you've already separated it so it's easy to change those easier to change those components out things like that prevent over configurability that comes back down to keep it simple you know i personally think that things should be as configurable as necessary so if it does need advanced configure configurability offer a way for somebody to drill in a little bit you know past the surface uh configuration but just don't just keep that interface simple use dependency injection if you think of like hello world then uh that hello world is the perfect example of a horrible program in such a short sweet simple form because for one your io is bound to excuse me to your program logic you have a string hard coded into your code things like that i won't get too far off but i could do a whole video on just hello world and a hundred things wrong about it but it's really cool because then you can go and factor it refactor it and make it into a proper program and then you then have a really a proper starting point to write a proper program and in all honesty hello world should be written as horribly as it is you just go in blast it out in that simple keep it simple form but then immediately when you turn around and review it you should be refactoring that and separating those components but anyway dependency ejection would be like if you did have if you were starting to uh, break apart that hello world program and when you go to call it you know your your main would call that it, hello world wouldn't be in main itself it would be a call from main and when you go to call it you would pass in for instance the output device that you want to use do you want to output to a gui or do you want to output to a console or whatever so that's just one example of how dependency injection just means pass in that configurable parameter you know that pass in the object that you want it to use maybe okay follow the law of demeter a class should only know its direct dependencies that one's hard for me to explain because by now i feel like i have such a better perspective on separations of concerns and stuff that i don't immediately think of bad examples but there is code out there especially for early coders that doesn't follow this and that's just that i mean it it just basically comes down to the fact like if something has too much do one thing and do it well you know so if su too much stuff knows about too many other things look at it and think like why is this passing through some value you know like if you're if there's like a middle of the road object and you're passing something through it to get to another object and yeah, maybe some primitive or something then you gotta wonder like i don't know that's probably not even the best description but that's just an off the cuff kind of example which you can do to a certain extent you know you can do that but uh if that middle of the road object is dependent on that thing that it's passing through for example like a type or something like that then that's bad so if it just passes it through as like a general encapsulated object kind of thing and it's just like part of the bundle whatever big deal then that's cool because then it could literally be any object right but if it is actually coming through based on some type or you know and then maybe even worse situation where your test is testing that 
you know some method in that middle of the road object for that type and all sorts of stuff like that no all bad right you know you want to keep your thing general and reusable to the highest level of degree possible especially once you're refactoring it and sort of molding it off into its own thing but initially of course go with that hello world style all that type of thing understandability tips number one be consistent if you do something a certain way do all similar things in the same way so one example that comes up is like variable naming if you're going to use like fetch retrieve or get as a prefix on a say a method then always use the word fetch or always use the word get try and be consistent like that on that note i think that using uh, especially git is like a code smell we shouldn't be doing getters and setters in this day and age but and then this also I don't want to go off too much on that right now but uh, this also comes down to consistencies with just everything just the style in general be consistent use explanatory variables so if you're having to add a comment to a variable name when you define it then obviously that variable is not explanatory enough be wordy be use two or three words if you have to for a variable name it should fit in the code and read pretty much like a sentence so that you can just stop go to the top of that block of code start reading it and the variable just explains itself then if you really just feel like hey this is you know three words or whatever is too long for this variable then you can go back later and or sooner and refactor to one or two words but just and don't use like acronyms for those words or uh, broken up words with like the vowels removed or things like that. If you have to, just cut the word in half. Or like previous instance, you might do like prev instance. But even that name, I, I don't think's that ideal, but I'm just using it as an example. All right, encapsulate boundary conditions. Boundary conditions are hard to keep track of. Put the processing for them in one place. I think the most simple example of that would be like a for loop because I don't know exactly what's what uh, for boundary conditions what exactly they're talking about here but in a for loop you have you know your initialization you have your test and then you have your uh, increment all right there all in one place one simple to keep track of place another situation might be uh, at the boundary of your your process of whether or not certain things are going out to other processes or across the internet or whatever type of thing so just try and keep all that logic pretty close so that it's not way apart from each other and you you aren't sure whether or not certain things are getting checked or not you can tell through some nice declarative code all in one place that they are prefer dedicated value objects to primitive type um i think that maybe this means like prefer maybe like a structure where you have a bunch of values bundled together instead of a primitive type and the reason i don't know you know some of these things i'm not absolutely positive i've never read the entire clean code book but i've watched like tons of videos from Bob Martin and read tons of these types of summaries online and stuff um, uh, an object or like a structure as opposed to a primitive type is more of an abstract data type right and an abstract data type in a nutshell you ask 10 people you probably get 10 different descriptions of what an abstract data type is but in a nutshell for the most part what an abstract data type is is just something closer to the real world users concept of what that value is so it even if it's just a string that's a word or something you want to make it so that it's like what is that word what is that sentence or whatever that 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 person is using is it an address is it something like that so you could really just obviously call it address string address and then give it a value or something but if you put it in an object then you could make it an address type so that when you pass it then you know you can do that check right there if you are using a type you know a, like a statically typed system or even a dynamically typed system too 
you can check that it's actually an address type. You know that you're not just getting some random string. That's just one example of why a dedicated value object. And in this day and age too, it's getting cheaper and cheaper to actually do objects instead of primitives. Primitives are another holdover from the old school styles of structure and imperative programming where uh, objects were just so heavyweight and so expensive. Computers were slower, uh, compilers and runtime systems were less efficient, so objects were heavyweights. So nowadays that's not so much the case, so it's a lot better to lean towards that object-oriented purity. Avoid logical dependency. Don't write methods which work correctly depending on something else in the same class. So I'll just kind of skip past that one. That's a, uh, I don't know how to explain that one that good. You just, you don't, that's another thing where I think it's just has to be really bad design that I'm just not used to anymore these days. I'm thinking it's a, uh, you just don't, you don't want to depend on things that are all over the place. I, I don't know how important something else in the same class is. I mean, what if it was something else somewhere else, you know, so almost saying that it depends on something else in the same class. I think is sort of a makes it even more ambiguous because you just don't want to have too many dependencies on anything you know you want everything funneled together and bundled together if necessary you know keep all your concerns together keep high cohesion and loose coupling avoid negative conditionals I would change the wording on that to avoid double negative conditionals so like if not false you know if a is not false or something like that you just say if a or if a is true you know things like that name rules choose descriptive and unambiguous names so the name like i mentioned before shouldn't require an additional comment it should read well like a sentence and it shouldn't be ambiguous it should describe whatever what it's doing or what it is it should be very descriptive as short as possible you know as reason within reason and uh, as descriptive as possible within reason make meaningful distinction it's better to be distinctly different than confusingly similar use pronounceable names that's another thing where you don't want to use acronyms stuff like that so worst case cut a name in half like prev um but otherwise do previous you know if if you can spare the space and it doesn't make your code look too verbose and stuff like that use searchable names so that goes down this one kind of coincides with that one replace magic numbers with name constants that allows that you're replacing it with a name and that name ideally would be searchable so don't just use a few letters or something you know like don't use f or vvv or stuff like that you know that's going to be in tons of source files you want to use like uh i can't even think of an f variable name right now frontier i don't know um avoid encodings don't append prefixes or type information if you've ever programmed for the windows api you're familiar with that you might have to do it in some situations, whatever, using low level languages or legacy code bases, things like that. It might make more sense, but it's something, especially in modern times to just, and high level languages to avoid as much as possible. So one thing is uh, don't add stuff to it. Like don't add the word object to an object, stuff like that, that's almost, you know don't be redundant in that regard don't pit like in python for example don't say um, name list just say names plural especially if it's something that's more primitive built into the language then just try and pluralize whatever it is for the word and ideally but if it's something where you're in a more in an environment like java and you have tons of variations of like different forms of lists and stuff then if need be you can tack on like the word list if it is specifically like whatever interface it provides you can tack that on 
function rules small. So keep them as small as possible. A few lines is the ideal size of a function. Once you get past a few lines of actual logic statements, then uh, you know, consider refactoring, breaking stuff out into smaller, more specific functions and making that function a more high level uh, sequence or procedure. Do one thing um, that's just don't do, you know, don't do this and that when you describe what the function's doing. Does it log the person in and display some particular screen, you know, log in and send to home screen or whatever? You don't want to do that. You want to break it up, especially for testability. So it would just be like log in and then another function, display home screen, things like that. And then you can either uh, create a sort of a function that can bag those together in a sequence so that you're just stepping down in the uh, abstraction layers or you can chain them if you're using an object oriented language use descriptive names of course they should read well and they should tell what the functions doing any side effects as well prefer fewer arguments ideally one or two so if you're having three four five or more arguments then consider uh, maybe the function is trying to do too many things or maybe you just need to put those arguments into some sort of data structure or an object that you can pass in a single object and especially when you consider it's also doubles down as an optimization as well as well as simplifying your code because uh, you know those objects and data structures are most likely going to get passed by reference whereas a bunch of primitive arguments that is all confusing and scattered around and hard to manage um, they're a lot of those will probably be passed by value potentially or just you know even if you consider them all by references you're still just passing a bunch of extra d words or whatever have no side effects so they should only they should not mutate the values that are passed to them they shouldn't go off and mutate some other object that you didn't pass to it and they should just return a value to to you basically so that's ideally that comes back to another thing where if you're working with legacy code and systems like C then there are uh, styles where you pass you know where you see the address of operator and things like that so that's just the way that is and in C it works okay because people are kind of used to that in C programming and also you see that address of operator or ideally you see that you're passing a pointer of some sort so it's pretty common when you see the address of operator and see that yeah that's going to get mutated and then C will use the return value as sort of a sentinel value of whether or not stuff worked and things like that whether or not there was an error but uh, definitely modern times avoid side effects especially with high level object oriented programming there's pretty much no reason to uh, have that happen don't use flag arguments or one thing too sorry is uh with the side effects thing is if you do want something to possibly mutate an object pass it the object and then have it return the reference to the object as well because uh what is it Actually, I don't want to say too much more on that to confuse it. Okay, don't use flag arguments. Split method into several independent methods that can be called from the client without the flag. So that's one thing is that if you're using flags, that's a smell that says, you know, true, false, stuff like that, where you can't tell. It's like, why am I passing in, you know, is color or something into here? And that points to the fact that you might be changing the uh, you might be trying to do two things two different things in that function you know what I mean so split those two functions up give them more descriptive names that describe the two different ways you know like uh, call with color you know do something with color or do something without color or just do something whatever and another thing is is that uh, you know, if you absolutely, if it does make more sense to include some flag, then just bundle that in an object and pass the object. You know, maybe that's some flag that goes along 
with the data and gets passed through to other things. So that is that. Then we get to the comment rules. Always try to explain yourself in code. Prefer code over comments. Make your code readable. That's a good one to have in number one. Don't be redundant. So obviously, like, don't say <laughs> assign five to n when right below it you're saying n equals five. I think that's obviously the stupidest example of that. But on any level, just don't don't talk about what the code is doing at a low level. If you do have to tack on a comment, um, try and describe it at a higher level of abstraction one higher level of abstraction at least than what's going on in that line or that block of code. Don't add obvious noise. So I, if it's obvious, then maybe you can decide what kind of noise that is. Just don't, don't add comments. Don't, don't do anything to just confuse the fact. Don't use closing brace comments. Prefer those single line comments. Don't comment out code, just remove. I kind of disagree with that one when prototyping. If there's any chance in the near future that you might uncomment out and use that code again, then go ahead and do that. This is more from the perspective of you're going to actually commit the code to like a code base, like at a company or something legit like that. Then, yeah, you usually don't want to commit commented out code into the uh, source code revision control system thing. I do sometimes. For my own personal code bases, I'll just comment out a block of code if if I have whatever feelings about it and then leave it for one commit because I don't like 100% relying on the uh, revision control system, but whatever. Use as explanation of intent. So that's more of like why instead of how. So you're like, this is to fix bug Da, da 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 That would be an intent, maybe. Use as a clarification of code. So this is like the first, it's considered like a code smell, but at first it's a pleasant smell, right? Because you look at a bunch of code you can't read and it's just disgusting. It's like, oh man, what was I doing there? You know, what crazy algorithm and stuff like that is going on there? So you can go through and dissect that code or at least tack a comment to the top of the block of code and that clarifies it sort of like potpourri in the bathroom right but then after that settles it's like well then you go back and review your code again at some point in the future and it's like okay should i factor this out to a function should i take that comment uh tighten it up and make it a function name a, a descriptive function name or maybe it is better like if it's just something that just you visit as a low-level engineer once a year in the code and you know you can wrap your head around it in a few minutes um, maybe, you know, if there's no other reason to go refactor that stuff, then don't do it, you know. But if it's something you're revisiting often and you're often trying to wrap your head around it, go ahead and factor that out. I was kind of unpacking that a little bit, but anyway. Use as warning of consequences. So removing this comment will make this uh, JavaScript break on Internet Explorer, for example. But I say removing this comment... I meant re removing this block of code could break this on da 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 as an example. Like those are okay comments to have. Source code structure, separate concepts vertically. So this is a thing where you, it's just sort of vertical alignment of concepts. Like if you think of everything on a horizontal line in a sentence, you know, you're going to have like the subject and the verb at whatever points. Um, Maybe that's a bad example, but what you want to do is you want to keep, if you think of going down the source code in blocks or in functions or methods or whatever, you just want to have your try and gravitate things towards each other. This whole thing right here is sort of like this, all this is a, a gray area because there's certain ideas in these lines that conflict with other ideas in this line. So it's just like, use your best judgment. So basically the separate concepts vertically is what all this is about. For the most part, related code should appear vertically dense. So that means that it should be very close to other related code, ideally. Um, declare variables close to their usage. So you're going to 
go down and you know if you have a for loop obviously maybe you declare like i right inside of that for loop instead of at the very top of your code of course if you're programming in like ANSI C you're going to have to declare that at the top of your scope right and then if you're programming in JavaScript you might uh, I I use hoisting I allow I use the very keyword in JavaScript so in that case the variables are automatically hoisted to the top so in that type of a situation you might just want to declare them at the top that way it's not ambiguous as to the fact that even though you declared it lower that you know some it is there higher as well still in the scope above to avoid that ambiguity ambiguity um, dependent functions should be close similar functions should be close place functions in the downward direction so I think this means this would unpack two functions should start out ideally at the top as more general short name general functions like your main function would go at the top and then the more specific stepwise functions would go down towards the bottom so your more public functions towards the top your more private functions towards the bottom and in a language like python where it has to parse you know it only knows it goes top down left to right like in a very literal sense so if it hasn't parsed a function yet then it doesn't know about its, its existence and you're going to get an error so that's why you'll see in a lot of python code where they'll say if name is main then call main if i have that right and uh so that's a little trick where you put that at the very bottom of the code and then it says hey if this is being run like a program instead of just being imported like a module then go ahead and find the main function and run that and the trick with that is that allows you to slap main at the very top even though otherwise in Python you'd have to fit main at the very bottom um, C programming is another language where you could run into something like that where you could use prototyping instead of pitting main at the very bottom you could pit main at the very top and then prototype your other functions so that uh, main function would be aware of those keep line short think these days people say like 120 lines I personally 40 to 60 I think is ideal they say that humans the way that their eyes read and everything a 40 to 60 character line is more ideal so I lean towards that I say 70 to 80 characters is like I use big zoomed in text and stuff like that but 100 120 seems to be more of like the industry standard these days don't use horizontal alignment so uh what is that I think I wrote some notes down here for that so extra white space between variables types and values or multiple variables declared to find on the same line so whenever you see people do the like tab over kind of space after like a variable type then they tab over do a name then maybe tab over and do an equal sign and a value and it just keeps everything lined up nice and sweet I don't think that's that bad but in a language like Java it does seem to be not as ideal because the uh, the type names and all that kind of stuff are just so big that you end up having to use a lot of white space between everything and it turns out weird and it does look better just to leave the so-called rag there but uh, like an assembly language I lower level languages I will do that high level languages I won't do that so much or I'll just do it for a few very you know if there's a couple that are really close and one off I'll just kind of do that I don't know there's various arguments but that's the general thing is don't do that and then the other horizontal alignment thing is like doing um, multiple variable declares on one line like the single ver keyword stuff like that I don't like that personally I know a lot of other people don't and then something I just recently saw that I don't remember seeing much if at all in the past was case statements on the same line to where multiple case like if you're doing a drop through case which for those are usually frowned upon but um, one example where they can kind of work good in older low-level languages is like if you need to do a case for a capital or a lowercase letter like push Y to continue or something then you can do a lowercase and a uppercase Y immediately after each other and then have the logic right under that right well, I saw something where somebody had done that and then they put them side by side instead of above and below each other and 
I just thought that was really bad. Okay. Use white space to associate related things and disassociate weakly related. So if you just think of blocks of code, the white space in between blocks of code, like I think that is a really good example of that. Don't break indentation. So that's just another thing of being consistent, following the same consistency rules. If files using tab or spaces instead of tabs, then don't put in tabs. Maintain the same indentation level and uh, especially in languages that allow it to vary. That's just one of those ones that I think is so obvious, but maybe a beginner needs to hear that. Objects and data structures, hide internal structure. So uh, these days to lump these two together is just almost ridiculous. I mean, an object technically is a data structure, but they it's really like if you're talking about data structures, it's almost a separate conversation these days, I feel like like quote unquote like more primitive data structures like data structures without much or any behavior that type of thing where objects should be primarily behavior and you should that's where hiding the internal structure you shouldn't know what what fields are in that object you should not know you know what private methods are in that object you should not know then all that stuff can change you just give it one good solid public interface that ideally is extendable and then you can add parameters to that interface or you can add a new method and uh, whatever and everything behind the scenes can vary. Prefer data structures? Oh, I don't know about this one like I definitely wouldn't say prefer data structures to objects I think that argument was being made and that might be the overlap of the old schoolness of just like data structures, you know, just a generic plain old object, so to speak, data structure, a bag of data, which is just horrible in any sort of object or in purest terms. Even if you add getters and setters, that's not cleaning up. That's that's just really ice in the turd, you know? So uh, anyway, with the preferred data structures thing, I think I'll just spin that around to say that uh, prefer abstract data types to primitives. I know that he's talking about objects to data structures, but I'm going to spin it. Um, yeah, an abstract data type instead of a primitive. And also maybe even coming from an object to a plain old data structure, just using the term loosely would be like a hash table, a linked list, things like that that are sort of these standardized objects that like if we talk about them, other people know, oh yeah, hash table, I know what you're talking about. So maybe preferring that instead of like reinventing like some quasi hash table type of thing, just try and try and lean towards something standard. And then the other thing is at boundaries of uh, at, at your system boundaries for like persistent storage. So like when you're talking to the database and things like that, it's more ideal to send like what's called like a DTO in Java data transfer object, um, things like that, where you're just saying they call them passive data structures and PDSs and I thought well that could stand for public data set too so if you're doing like a public data set anything that's going to go outside of your program to literally the general public even then you want to just use make that available as some sort of like really generic data structure that doesn't have like some like a JSON object right or like a um, C CSV comma separated values table stuff like that avoid hybrid structures half object half data I think that boils down to just like avoid public fields because you know obviously an object's got to have you know probably has fields in it or whatever but if you don't expose those fields then you don't have a traditional passive data structure right and then this also says to me avoid getters and setters too in that sense of just avoid bags of data you know either go full object and have everything be very behavior method interface oriented or just go pure plain old data structure and have like ideally no you know no uh, methods on it whatsoever should be small just like the functions you know they can be bigger than functions obviously because they might contain multiple functions multiple fields things like that but they should be as small as possible 
as soon as it grows to more than like maybe two screenfuls or a screenful or whatever, then you should consider uh, that maybe you could factor it out into multiple objects. Each object, like functions and methods, should do one thing and do it well or have one concern. Small number of instance variables, just all these things just boil down to keep it simple, just try and minimize everything. Don't don't do more don't overcomplicate stuff. Base class should know nothing about their derivatives. So that's another one of those things where I think it's just such horrible coding that I don't know really. I guess they shouldn't have a list. I mean, I guess they could have a list of their derivatives, right? Maybe they could have a list of their instances. I don't know. But what it comes down to is you just don't want to have anything that they quote unquote know about their derivatives or probably that knowledge, those fields or whatever should just go in the derivatives, you know, so in the subclass instead of the superclass, that type of a thing. But maybe having a list, I guess you wouldn't want to have a list of subclasses. That wouldn't make sense most of the time. So that would be something to avoid. But you could have a list of instances. That should be okay. Because that's an actual implementation. That's an actual instance, right? So this is saying that that abstract, more of that uh, the class itself. Anyway, better to have many functions than to pass some code into a function to select a behavior. That goes back to that same thing as passing in a flag. Split your functions up. Don't have like this be all to every one function type of thing going on. Prefer non-static method to static methods. So that comes back to more of the object oriented purity route of uh, if you're doing static methods, then those are really probably utility methods like system.out.println in Java. Um, that's a code smell. That, that was a horrible design decision on their part to do that because of a lot of things. But that was, um, that was sort of making a concession for the uh, C programmers and stuff like that that were more used to just like having this utility function to call like printf, things like that. So that really should have been a... Uh, like the the print line function should really you should be creating an object that has whatever output device that represents whatever output device you know you're going to create a general object that you can just re write to regardless of the output device but it will be somehow bound to an output device internally that you don't know the specifics of you just know the interface that you're going to write to it and then you would call the print line method on that to print a line and then you could have another one that, you know, one that prints to a GUI, one that prints to a logger, one that prints to a console, whatever, stuff like that. But when you have a static one, it's just sort of like there all the time, loaded all the time. It's leaning away from uh, designing an object-oriented system properly. Test, one assert per test. That says exactly what it's saying, you know, especially in like in Python, you can literally have an assert statement, right? That assert statement is a test. Every time you see the word assert, that's your test. If you need to assert two things, put it in two different tests. And ideally, that assert would just be a true or false type of scenario. Um, readable, yeah. They Just like all the rest of your code in your program, it should be as readable, simple, short, do one thing, do it well as possible, fast. You don't want it to, especially for unit tests, you don't want them to take very much time because you should ideally be running hundreds, if not thousands of those at a time, and they need to complete very quickly. So things that take a long time are probably better in an integration test. You know, you shouldn't be calling out over the network in a unit test. That's just, that's an integrated integration test. So if you can't keep it fast, that's that's a sure sign of that independent so uh, one unit test shouldn't rely on another unit test at all they should be able to run and you should be able to scramble the order of them and they should still run and complete same speed the same accuracy all that uh, and that's a good way to test your unit test too is to scramble them up and 
run them in different orders. Repeatable, so they should be consistent. That you shouldn't get run the test one time and you get one answer and then you run it 50 more times and then you get a different answer. You know, unless it happened something literally broke, but if all this, you know, oh yeah, just one in 50 times roughly it randomly gives a five, you know, a false instead of a true or something. And that's another reason to do the true and false thing too, is just it either works or it doesn't. But that's the repeatability. If the, if the test is intermittently failing, then you either need to figure out what that problem is or delete the test because it's not doing you any good when that test passes and you think everything's fine and then somewhere down the road it's going to break. And then to basically sum it up here, we have uh, code smells, rigidity, the software is difficult to change, a small change causes a cascade of subsequent changes, so your program's rigid. Program's fragile if the software breaks in many places due to a single change. Immobility, you cannot reuse parts of the code in other projects because of involved risks and high effort. Needless complexity, needless repetition. Opacity, the code is opaque and hard to see through. It's not transparent. So if you, especially rigidity and fragility, if you're experiencing those things, that means you have a lot of technical debt that you did not pay off as you were going along. So you can probably, if you sit down and knock it out, you'd be surprised how quick, you know, I've done things in a matter of hours that I thought were going to take a matter of days when I just sat down and did some heavy refactoring before to fix rigid and fragile programs. But, um, that that is a, a definite sign that going forward when you write code you should be just do that write the failing test make the test pass by doing the simplest thing that could work and then review and refactor that code right away and then just keep doing that and sometimes the review and refactor might be oh you know maybe I could have done this if statement a little more compact or something and other times it might be that you look at your code and see the way that it's fitting together with the older pieces and think, you know what, just like with the Hello World example, again, returning to that to where it's like, you know what, maybe I should separate those concerns there. You know, now that this is starting to grow, I can see in the future, I know the customer's talking about wanting, you know, to do this in a graphical user interface. And right now I'm prototyping it at the console. So I might as well just nip that in the bud and separate that. So anyway, that's that. Thanks for listening. And if you have any questions or want to yell at me because I did something, explained something wrong, feel free to do that. And thanks a lot.